Praise the Lord. Once again, I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone. Equip everyone. Develop everyone. So that we will be the kind of leaders, the kind of preachers, the kind of pastors, and the kind of coordinators, overseers, we ought to be in Jesus' name. And the Lord help us to have real, deep, practical understanding of His Word. When leaders are limited in their understanding, it affects the lives of the people they are leading. And the people they are leading might think they are getting the right thing. But unfortunately, if leaders are shallow in their understanding, they will not be able to prepare anyone for heaven. God help us to prepare people for heaven. Father, we look up to you today that by your spirit, you give us real understanding in your word so that as the word affects us, cleanses us, purges us, you will use us as instruments to be a change agent in the lives of the people we're leading. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to a subject tonight that we need to have clear scriptural understanding. The leaders in Israel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they thought they understood and they concentrated on being clean from the uncleanness of the past. That is, the uncleanness highlighted in Leviticus and Numbers and a part of Deuteronomy. And they were meticulous about being clean, being clear from those uncleannesses. But when Christ came, number one, there was a lot of unclean spirit in the land of Israel. Think about that. The people who thought they were very careful to separate themselves from uncleanness. And they thought, don't touch this, you'll be unclean. Don't touch that, you'll be unclean. And they observed that perfectly. Yet, unclean spirit took hold of many people. As you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus going about. He cast unclean spirit away from this one, from the man, from the woman, from the child, from the boy. Unclean spirits everywhere. Yet, they thought, they understood being free from uncleanness. Not only that, when Christ was here, they washed their hands. They washed their feet. And they were washing and washing and washing in a way to be free from uncleanness. And yet, Jesus said, inside you, you're full of extortion and uncleanness. The point is, the people who only read Numbers, and they think, don't touch that, don't take that, that will make you unclean, and they're so very meticulously careful, yet uncleanness abode in them. That's the reason why, as you come to the Bible, you're asking yourself, which kind of uncleanness are you free from? The uncleanness in numbers 
or the uncleanness a revelation that says if you're unclean in this way and you die in that condition you might be clean in view of Leviticus and Numbers if you are unclean in view of the New Testament and New Covenant you are gone that's the reason why we need to pay attention what's uncleanness how do we get free from uncleanness how do we stay free from uncleanness tonight we're looking at divine cleansing from the uncleanness that damns the soul divine cleansing from the uncleanness that damns the soul in numbers chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 17 numbers chapter 19 verse 17 and for an unclean person they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin and running water shall be put there too in a vessel look at verse 19 in verse 19 and the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at evening and then in verse 20 in verse 20 it says but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he has defiled the sanctuary of the lord the water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him he is unclean and then in verse 22 in verse 22 and whatsoever the unclean person touches shall be unclean and the soul that touches it shall be unclean until evening uh, let's now come to ephesians chapter 5 new testament and we're reading from verse 5 and here is where we have to have understanding because if we don't have understanding in this if we are still back in the old covenant and we're clean in view of the old covenant here comes the new covenant is not about touching and taking and till the evening till seven days this is a very life ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 5 but this ye you know that no monger no unclean person unclean person no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of christ and of god in verse 6 in verse 6 let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of god upon the children of disobedience uh, we're looking at divine cleansing from the uncleanness that damns the soul we're coming now to uh, three points number one number one the condition clean before the law but unclean before the lord those children of israel at the time of christ those pharisees those sadducees clean before the law but unclean before the lord number two the cleansing cleansed by the lord 
of spotted by lawlessness cleansed by the lord and because they were cleansed by the lord the believers the children of god washed in the blood of the lamb they remained unspotted by lawlessness number three the consistency the constancy the continuity clean today and clean tomorrow and clean every time the consistency clean for the lord consumed by zeal like our lord let's look at number one number one the condition clean before the law but unclean before the lord we're looking at matthew chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 25 these were pharisees these were sadducees and these were the leaders of the land they were clean they were meticulous about being clean in view of leviticus and numbers but they were not clean in view of the expectation of the lord in the new covenant it says in matthew chapter 23 verse 25 warn to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but within the full of extortion and excess look at isaiah 65 verse 5 isaiah 65 Verse 5, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. I am holier than thou. They observed all those uh, ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And they got to the point, to the peak, they thought, they were holier than everybody, clean before the law, but unclean before the Lord. And it says these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. The Lord said, you think you are holy, you think you are holier than everybody else, because you carry the holiness, external holiness. But inwardly, they didn't have the life of purity, of righteousness, of holiness. And the Lord said, there is smoke in my nose. And it says, there is fire that burn all the day. Look at three things here. Number one, number one, outwardly clean but inwardly unclean and condemned. Number two, openly conscientious. They're conscientious. They take care of everything. Don't touch that. Don't taste that. Wash your hand. Wash your feet. And they were conscientious, openly, yet individually unholy and carnal. Number three, obviously compromised they compromised the faith they compromised the standard they compromised the truth obvious to everybody Ob obvious to christ obvious to disciples of christ obviously compromised yet internally unconcerned and content satisfied they were satisfied by what they were doing and what they could do they were satisfied by the open outward correctness they were correct according to i didn't touch a dead body i didn't take anything that makes me unclean and they were so conscientious but they were compromised and they remained content unconcerned even for their own conversion. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at outwardly clean, but inwardly unclean and condemned. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. 
Here are the words of Jesus. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, warn to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto the whited sepulchre, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness internally inside them in their mind in their thoughts in their plans in their action in their proposals in their vision in the things that directed their lives they were full of all uncleanness verse 28 in verse 28 even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity verse 33 ye serpents Ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell on the external, outwardly? They appeared clean. They meticulously observed all those clean, clean, clean approaches in the Old Testament. But in their hearts, they were unclean, and Jesus said, You perfectly keep yourself clean, according to Numbers chapter 19, but you are still candidates for hell fire, ye serpents, and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Look at number two here. Point number two here, openly conscientious, yet individually unholy and carnal. Openly, openly, openly. As you see them, and they walk carefully, and they watch what they come in contact with, and they appear perfectly, perfectly, outwardly clean, yet on the inside, in the private, they were unholy, they were carnal. Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. Matthew 23. We're looking at verse 5. It says, All their works they do to be seen of men outwardly. All their works, all their works. They move this way, they move that, and they're watching. Who is watching them? What do they do so that in the public, they'll appear clean unto the Lord. But all their works they do, for to be seen of men, to be praised of men, to be appreciated of men. And when they compare their lives with Deuteronomy, with, uh, you know, numbers, and with Leviticus, the people that read all those things, don't touch, don't taste, and don't, don't take, they praise them. And that's why they do what they do. It says they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And look at Second Kings chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 16. Second Kings chapter 10. 
verse 16 here jehu now is calling on jonadab and he said come with me and see my zeal for the lord so they made him ride in his chariot and in verse 17 verse 17 tells us and when he came to samaria he slew all that remained unto ahab in samaria till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the lord which is speak by elijah here is jehu and he said come jonadab come and see how zealous i am openly openly conscientious yet unholy on the inside unholy in thought unholy in life unholy in his disposition towards the lord look at verse 31 in verse 31 but jehu this man was very zealous come and see my zeal for the lord but jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the lord god of israel with all his heart for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. That's why we need to be watchful in our lives and meticulous about that, about my inner life. I'm conscientious about this, how about my inner life? On the outside, you appear orderly, you appear acceptable to God but on the inside like Jehu zealous conscientious on the outside but on the inside he took no heed for his heart did not follow after the Lord he went astray and he followed Jeroboam which made Israel to sin Hosea chapter 8 reading from verse 3 in Hosea chapter 8 verse 3 Israel has cast off the thing that is good they went on open outward external cleanliness external devotion to the Lord external observance and obedience to the law of the Lord but on the inside Israel has cast off the thing that is good the enemy shall pursue him look at verse 8 in verse 8 Israel is swallowed up now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure you beach outwardly externally all those laws given in Leviticus, in Numbers, don't touch this. If you touch that, you're unclean. And they remain clean by observing those things. But, but, they mix themselves, they mingle themselves among the Gentiles until God said, I don't have any pleasure in that vessel called Israel, the unclean on the inside. Look at your life. Look at your disposition. Look at your thoughts. Look at your behavior. Look at your character. And look at your attitude towards the things of God. From the depth of your heart, will God say, He doesn't have pleasure in Him? He's active boisterous he goes here and there he does this and that it's only to impress the people the public but i have no pleasure in him. look at verse 12 in verse 12 this is what god is saying now he says i have reached to him 
the great things of my law, the ones that relate to the heart. I wrote unto him, but they were counted as a strange thing. And that's why we need to watch in our lives. Does our life only center on outward things, external things, and we become like Pharisees and Sadducees? And uh, when I don't touch that, I don't drink that, I don't wear that, I don't put on that. But on the inside, what does God see? Number three, number three, obviously compromised, yet internally unconcerned and content, obviously compromised. I was still standing on conviction like we had originally. Remember when you were born again. Remember when you first knew the Lord. Remember your commitment to the Lord. Whether somebody was there, somebody was not there. Remember you are a man of conviction, a woman of conviction. Where is that conviction now? Doesn't religion now center on what I do? you when they see me about what I do when they don't see me many people now obviously compromised their lifestyle and they're not looking at the word anymore they're looking at that is so and so they're looking at mommy so and so and once that is so and so mommy so and so approves of them what does daddy so and so know about you? Only the external thing, only what you say, only what we see. What does mommy so and so know about you? Only what you do when you are in their presence. And you won't do all those things, you won't bring out your thoughts, those dirty thoughts, those defiling thoughts, those evil things. You'll not bring them out in the presence of daddy so and so, mommy so and so. But we need to think of who are we on the inside? What do we do on this? What is our conviction? Number three here, obviously compromised, yet internally unconcerned and content. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. Compromised, compromised, yet unconcerned. And what will you do in the end thereof? Hosea chapter 7, reading from verse 8. Hosea chapter 7, verse 8, Ephraim. He has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Burnt up on one side, raw on the other side. A cake not turned. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, Strangers have devoured his strength. Strangers. Have devoured his strength. Let's not talk about different, talk about deeper life. Strangers, the strangers that come, they help, they publicize us, and they, you know, appreciate us. But do we allow them to create an inroad into our conviction? that we cannot preach what we used to preach. We cannot emphasize what we used to emphasize. We cannot be pointed and pungent. And we cannot talk of repentance the way we ought to. I'm asking if we're like that, they will be like a frame. We cannot point at what the life of a real child of God should be. We cannot talk of restitution in marriage, restitution 
if you have stolen and now you build mansions if you're going to be right with God you have to make restitution can we preach that again by the grace of God I do by the grace of God I can I'm asking the rest of deeper life where do we stand have the strangers come into us so much that they've devouched our strength they have broken down our conviction they were brought they, they have deemed our sight that we cannot see anymore that's exactly the controversy that God had with the children of Israel strangers have devouched his strength and he knows it not he knows it not. He's cooperating with this and cooperating with that. He's giving it to this and giving it to that. And his strength, the strength of his early youth in serving the Lord, in preaching the gospel, the strength is devoured, is destroyed. The strength is gone. And he knows it not. Think about that. In your own local church, the backbone you used to have, think about it. The strength you used to take, think about it. But now, as we mingle with this, and mingle with that, and mingle with that, and we're looking for something. We're not looking for souls to be saved. We're not looking for those who are saved to stand by the truth of the word of God. Strangers have come in. And they have devouched the strength. And he, know, he knows it not ye gray ears are here and there upon him. Yet he knows it not. Uh, Ephraim, what happened to you? Israel, what happened to you? You don't use the mirror anymore. Think about a person who doesn't have any mirror in his bathroom does not have mirror in his room and goes in goes out no mirror and he's not looking at the mirror and gray ears signs of old age weakening attitude and he doesn't have any mirror to look at. And because he's not looking at the mirror, can you think of a person who didn't look at the mirror for one year, for two years, for seven years? Many people don't look at the mirror of the Word of God anymore. And to compare what the mirror says and tells about them and how they look. And everybody, they see the gray air here and there. The signs of weakness, old age. They see it every time. But he doesn't have a mirror to look at. He has the mirror. He's not looking at, looking at the mirror. He knows it not. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and the pride of Israel testifies to his face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Look at verse 16. Okay, we have returned to the Lord. Now, who says we have not returned to the Lord? We come to church, we come to the temple, and we're still observing what we're reading in numbers and we still don't touch this and don't take this and don't take that look at verse 16 they return but not to the most high they return but not to the most high they return to what people expect them to return to they return to what will please their heathen neighbors but they have not returned wholeheartedly unto the lord they are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Unconcerned, unholy, unconverted. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Matthew chapter 13, 
verse 15, for these people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted. No, they were not converted. They closed their eyes. Their minds are dull. Once they are obeying, don't touch and don't take and don't taste and they feel they were clean, they felt that was all. And they were not converted, lest they should be converted and I should heal them. Let's come to point number two. In point number two, the cleansing, cleansed by the Lord and was spotted by lawlessness. You know, lawlessness is all around. And if a Christian is not prayerful, if a Christian is not careful, if a Christian is not watchful, if a Christian is not faithful, it will, you know, just be influenced by the lawlessness around. And he doesn't think about it. He just does whatever he wants to do, whatever occurs to him, whatever he sees other people doing. And the church, whatever other churches are doing, and you know, you see it on social media, you see here and there, they are doing that. Why not us? Well, you must remember, others may tell me, I cannot, others may. You see, that, that is different between those who are following after the Lord and those who are following after the world. The cleansing. Cleansed by the Lord, or spotted by lawlessness. Ezekiel, I'm reading from chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. This God talking to Israel. They thought what they did by themselves, what they avoided by themselves, they thought. That was good enough. God said, no, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, and you cannot be clean until this almighty God sprinkles that water of heaven upon you before you can become clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols well, I cleanse you. Verse 26. In verse 26, in your heart also, will I give you a new spirit, will I put within you. Your life depends on the spirit that is within you. There's the spirit of the world. There's a spirit of bondage. There's a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of compromise. There's a spirit of the Adamic nature. And there is a spirit of God. And your life, what you do, how you live in the public, in the private, secretly, publicly, your life depends on the spirit that controls you from within. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Let the church say amen. amen. Now, think about the Pharisees, what kind of heart did they have? Christ came to them. The kind of heart they had was whatever Jesus said, they will not agree. They had a stony heart. And if he continued saying what he was saying, they didn't agree with, they'll find a way to get rid of him, crucify him. 
Hype out Barabbas. Release Barabbas. He's a son of the soil. Yes, he's a criminal, but a son of the soil. Release him or crucify this Christ. Yeah, the stony heart. And God said, I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. My spirit within you. If you have his spirit, you will live to please him. You will live to walk in his way. You'll be tender. You'll be gentle. You'll be holy. You'll be meek. You'll be humble. If you have his spirit living in you, you will not be hard hearted, uncontrollable, incorrigible. You'll not be self willed if you have his spirit in you you'll be grateful that you are hearing the word of god i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them look at verse 28 in verse 28 and ye shall dwell in the land that i gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and i will be your god verse 29 in verse 29 i will also save you from all your uncleanlinesses it's not what you do by yourself a bridge numbers chapter 19 don't touch that dead body and don't do this, don't do that. If you do that, you'll die. Because of the fear of death, you may not touch all that. But I put the one inside your heart. And God says that he is the one that has the grace, that has the cleansing water, that has the cleansing blood of Christ that will cleanse you. It says, I will also save you from all your uncleannesses. And I will call for the corn. I will increase it and lay no famine upon you. Look at James chapter 1. Reading from verse 27. James chapter 1. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in the affliction. Look at this, look at this. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. The world is a world of lawlessness. They act as if there's no constitution. As if there's no law, as if there's no right or wrong, as if there's no ruler to draw a straight line, lawless. But when the Lord cleanses us, he makes us as cleansed by the Lord, unspotted by lawlessness. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the blood that cleanses from all uncleanness. Number two, the blessing of conscience without any uncleanness. Number three, the burden of converting the adamantly unclean. That's, that's a ministry, that's a calling that those who are unclean and they are adamantly unclean, incorrigibly unclean. The Lord has sent us to them to persuade them. The Lord has sent us to them to call them out of their adamant uncleanness so that they surrender their lives to the Lord. But if we who are supposed to be instruments to convert the adamantly unclean, if we too are incorrigible, adamant, unclean, how 
will an unclean person convert another unclean person didn't you read when we read through uh, numbers chapter 19 the clean person well, being the water of separation and uh, the one that will sprinkle that on the unclean person you have to be clean before you can be of any use to help the unclean to become uh, clean we're looking at number one number one we're looking at the blood that cleanses from uh, all uncleanness in first john chapter one Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Brothers and sisters, sorrowful to think that the people who say they're believers today, they don't believe in the blood that cleanses from all uncleanness. The believing of today, the faith of today, in many circles, I believe, I believe. And they remain in the uncleanness, unclean language, unclean tongue, unclean behavior unclean interaction unclean lustful behavior they remain like that and it's unfortunate that the salvation many people claim is salvation in the head is not the salvation that touches their heart but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin it tells us in 2nd Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 2nd Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 have been there for these promises daily beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh filthiness of the flesh filthiness of the flesh when flesh touches flesh brings filthiness when flesh interacts with flesh and there are people they are eager for their flesh to touch another person's flesh are they born again we don't know we don't know if they're eager if that's all their dream flesh it says having the promises of God dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit affecting holiness in the fear of God look at Psalm 51 in Psalm 51 reading from verse 2 Psalm 51, reading from verse 2, it says, Wash me thoroughly, not superficially. The people will see today, even among those who have been in a New Testament Bible believing church for many years, they don't have a thorough, thorough washing. They're a little bit different from the people of the world. They're superficially washed. But it says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from 
my sin. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me, wash me, wash me. I don't want to be just as white as snow. I want to be whiter than snow. You know, the desire you have. The passion you have is what determines what you get. If you want to be so pure, purer than diamond, if you want to be so white, whiter than snow, if that is your passion, it will determine how you pray, it will determine the kind of experience of salvation you have, it will determine the kind of sanctification you profess. It says, purge me. With Aesop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. In verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at the blessing of conscience without any uncleanness. The blessing of a conscience that has no uncleanness. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, it says, without spot to God. Do you ever think of the sacrifice of Christ? The agony of Christ, the suffering of Christ, everything he went through to shed his blood so that we can be saved, sanctified, clean, cleansed, purged, purified. It says he offered himself unto God, purge your conscience, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. When Christ walks on us, when he cleanses us, when he purges our conscience, our conscience will become sensitive. It's like you clean up the mirror and then the mirror is now clear and will bring the right picture unto you. But you see there are people their consciences doesn't appear their consciences are purged by the blood of Christ and so they act as if there's no conscience your conscience is the policeman inside you that says first of all a watchman don't go there if you are getting nearer and nearer your conscience if it's still alive is saying you are getting nearer the edge of the cliff. You might fall down there. And if you fall down there, you'll crush your own bones. And when you've done something, that's not right. I warned you. I told you. It's the policeman that will arrest you and convict you. But there are people that just go from uncleanness to uncleanness, from bad behavior to bad action and there's no conscience that's why we're told in first timothy chapter four in first timothy chapter four reading from verse two it says in verse two speaking lies in hypocrisy they have to do that to cover up what they do to make excuses for what they do and to make excuses for the uncleanness they get to every time speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron acts chapter 24 reading from verse 16 here in do i exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. When the blood of Christ washes and cleanses us from all uncleanness, we're sensitive. I don't want to do anything 
that will soil my hand, that will sear my conscience, that will harden my heart and hearing. Do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men? Number three here is the burden of converting the adamantly unclean. That's the burden we have. You read, when you read the prophets, the burden of Isaiah, the son of Amos, the burden of Amos, the burden of this other prophet, the burden we have is the burden to convert the people who are adamantly unclean. And you start from the nearest person to you. They are unclean, they are adamant, they are depraved, they are hardened, and it looks like Although they talk about heaven, heaven, heaven almost every day, but they don't have the mind to pay the price to even stop and think about their lives, the way I'm going and the things I'm doing, and we don't know when death will come, brothers and sisters. We don't know. It might come suddenly, unprepared. And the fellow had been adamantly unclean. Where? Will he spend eternity? The people who are unclean like that, look at this. In Proverbs chapter 30, and I'm reading from verse 12. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation that appear in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. People who rush to church, they hear the word of God. They are supposed to pray after that. And instead of just staying there and pouring out their hearts to God, so they can be cleansed, saved, restored, refined, purified. Time is more important to them. They're looking at their time. They're looking at rushing out. When will you ever have the cleansing that prepares you for heaven in a hurry all the time? Hearing the word, we're looking at the wristwatch when a hurry. After hearing the word, time is going, Pastor. There's a busy city. Before we get home, do you know when we got home the other time? And then you get back home, you continue life as usual. When will you prepare for eternity? Because there's a generation of people who are pure in their own eyes, and yet it's not washed from their filthiness. Look at Psalm 51. And I'm reading from verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me by thy free spirit. Look at verse 13. Then, only then, will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 24. Romans chapter 1, the people who are adamantly unclean. Wherefore God also give them up to uncleanness, 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 through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And everybody said, Amen. verse 26, in verse 26, for this cause, God gave 
them up. They are adamant. They are incorrigible. They are hard-hearted. God give them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, but in their lust, one toward another, men with men, men with men, men with men, walking that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which is meat. That's why they have HIV AIDS. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, their adamant, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they are hardened against God. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge and they have the stony heart and their self-will they do not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient verse 29 in verse 29 being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, and full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. Bastachi, it says, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. The evil things that were not even there before they were born, now they invent them. The crimes of the world to them, they are not enough. The transgressions of the world, they are not enough. The uncleanness in the world, not enough. Now, they have to invent evil things. Disobedient to parents, verse 31, without understanding. Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. But started to knowing the judgment of God. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. But not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They give encouragement. To the people that do evil, here we are. We're supposed to warn the wicked. We're supposed to persuade them to repent. And the people who are called by God to persuade and to draw the sinners to God, they are the people encouraging sinners to continue in their sins. May God bring us to the very foundation of our calling in Jesus' name. Look at point number three here. Point number three, the consistency. Clean for the Lord, consumed like our Lord. I say, chapter 52 and we're reading from verse 1. I say 52. Reading from verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on the beautiful garment. So Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. I thought you were saying, Amen. Not come into us the uncircumcised and the unclean. What do we do to purge out? What do we do to expunge the uncircumcised and the unclean from among us? We start from ourselves. 
to make sure that our hearts are circumcised by the Lord himself so that he takes everything unclean away from our heart, away from our life, away from our disposition. What do we do? That we don't have the unclean in our midst anymore. We start from ourselves that the obvious unclean things in our lives were sincere, were honest, and we go to the altar of the Lord, call upon the Lord, and let him wash away, cleanse away everything that is unclean. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from this, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 139. Psalm 119 verse 139. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten thy word. When you see that, that locality, they have forgotten the word of the Lord. That assembly, they have forgotten the word of the Lord. And they're drawing people, they're drawing people that love uncleanness, they love the lust of the flesh. They love all those, um, you know, things that make their flesh touch flesh. And you see that they're forgetting the word of the Lord in many assemblies and many churches and many denominations. Even our own churches, you know, some of the branches, you look at this, you look at that. You have zeal for the Lord. My zeal has consumed me because... My enemies have forgotten thy words. Look at John chapter 2 verse 17. John 2 verse 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up, consumed me. That's why we're looking at the consistent will to have. Consistency, clean for the Lord and consumed by zeal like our Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, building the faith of clean, cleaving converts. The converts that come to the Lord, building them up, building up their faith, and making them cleave unto the Lord. Number two, bearing the fruit of cleansed, courageous Christians. We are bearing the fruit, the fruit of evangelism, the fruit of the GCK. They we're following up on them, and we want those fruits to be cleansed, courageous Christians, not just like the wishy-wash uh, Christians, that, you know, they are not different from the people that are still in their sins. Number three, bold faithfulness in clean, clear conviction. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. When you have conviction, you'll be bold. And when your conviction is more important to you, to the Lord, and to the church, than any gain you have in the world, you retain the boldness in that faithfulness of the clean and clear conviction. We're looking at number one, building the faith of clean, cleaving converts. We're looking at Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad. And exhorted them all that were purpose of heart, they will cleave unto the Lord, cleave 
unto the Lord. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. It says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one. Look at verse 31, 32. It said, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. As the husband leaves the parents and cleaves to the wife, so the church leaves the world and cleaves to Christ. So the Christian leaves the world and cleaves to Christ. I'm asking you now, are you like you are married to Christ? Really? Practically? Purposefully? Passionately? Are you cleaving unto the Lord? Are you leaving all the sins of the world? It says it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church will cleave unto him. Look at number two here. Number two, bearing the fruit of cleansed, courageous Christians. The Christian in the world, if it's not courageous, he will not remain a Christian. The world will convert him back to the world. They won't allow him to follow Christ single-heartedly. They won't allow him to follow the Lord with conviction, with persuasion, with passion, because the world, they are, they are at it. They are walking day and night to make sure that they turn the Christian back to the world. And so, if we're going to build up any fruit, if we're going to raise up any fruit, if we're going to have abiding fruit in Christianity, we'll have to bear the fruit of cleansed, courageous, Christians, Christians who have backbone enough, they have conviction enough to resist the world and to say, world, stop right there. I'm no more of the world, and I do not love any of those things that have been perpetrated and sold by the world. The Lord help us. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, Barnabas finding Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And taught much people and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians, the Christ-like ones, first in Antioch. Acts 26, reading from verse 28. Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said, unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You know the beauty of it? At that time, the fellow knew he wasn't yet a Christian. He had the word. He loved the word. He was almost convinced. He said, Paul, you know what? You want me to be a Christian, but I know I am not yet. Wouldn't that be good if the people who are not Christians know that they are not Christians? Almost. That persuades me to be a Christian. Verse 29. In verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God 
that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together, almost and all together, with their heart, with their soul, with their mind, with real conviction, even though it was a man of authority, a man of politics, and yet Paul the Apostle said, you know what I want for you? I want you to not just be almost, but all together a Christian such as I except these bounds in first peter chapter 4 reading from verse 12 it said beloved think it not strange concerning the varied trial which is to try you try your faith as though some strange thing happened unto you verse 13 in verse 13 but rejoice and as much as she are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse 14, it says, if ye be reproached, if ye be insulted, if ye be assaulted, if ye be abused for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Look at verse 15. It says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief was an evil doer, was a busy body in other men's matters, verse 16, but yet if any man suffer as a Christian, like Christ suffered, if any man suffer as a Bible believer, if anyone suffer as a Christian who will not Compromise. If anyone suffer as a steadfast believer, following after the way and the word and the will of the Lord, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. We're looking at number three here. Number three here, bold faithfulness in clean clear conviction clean clear conviction if somebody ought to follow you through life every day to the secret to the public hearing everything you say seeing everything you do seeing your interaction with people seeing your transparency seeing your life if anyone were to follow you and will not allow you any moment or any minute to be absent from him what will that person be able to tell as your conviction he hears every conversation he sees every act he looks at everything what Will he tell, will he be able to tell about your conviction? Now, that's what we want to be. We want to be bold, we want to be faithful, clean, clear, with a real, definite conviction that there will be no mistake in the mind of anyone. This man is a man of conviction. And we can tell you, this is his conviction. This woman a woman of conviction and we can tell you this is her conviction but if you live a life that nobody can really tell what's his conviction yes we know he goes to a deeper life but what is her 
personal conviction. What can they tell about you? The Lord wants us to have the faithfulness and the boldness that we'll have. Everybody will see the clean, the clear conviction that we have. We're looking at Acts chapter 4 verse 13. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And he took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Boldness that they had been with Jesus. We're looking at First John chapter four, reading from verse seventeen. First John chapter four, verse seventeen. Herein is our love made perfect. Herein is a consecration made perfect. Herein is our friendship and fellowship with the Lord made perfect. Herein is our devotion made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We need to remind ourselves that those who are bold to sin here in life will not have boldness on the day of judgment. When the books are opened, when the writings and the records are read, the people that have boldness to sin on earth, they will not have boldness in the day of judgment. The people who compromise, the people who live topsy-turvy life, so-so life, not really having feet to stand, they will not have boldness in the day of judgment. But herein is a love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world as he is so are we in this world verse 18 it says there is no fear in love if you love the sinner there's no fear in love you preach the truth to him if you love that friend, there's no fear in love. You preach the truth to your friend. If you want to prevent that soul from getting to hell, if you want that soul to get to heaven, and the love in your heart is that he will get to heaven by the sacrifice of Christ and by your effort, you're not going to be fearing them. If you're a pastor, and you love your congregation, and you, your love for them is that they must get to heaven. You'll not be afraid of them. If they don't understand the word, and they act like this and like that, you preach it again, because you love. If they you know, ignorantly react against you, if you really love them, you're not going to fear them, because you know if you fear them, you won't keep on telling them the truth. There is no fear in love. Preachers, let's be full of the love of God, and love will make you to forget whatever you go through it just like the mother who is uh, you know giving birth to a child she goes through pain and she still loves the baby because of that she's still going through the pain after the child is born she's still going through some pain but she never gives up on that child she does what she ought to do because of love because of love she can sacrifice her life for the love of that child and that's how we who are fathers and mothers and the lord that's what we should have there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment he that feareth because he's afraid he measures his word 
It doesn't tell the backslider to repent and be restored. It doesn't tell the sinner to repent and be saved. It doesn't tell the one on his way to hell. It doesn't stop him and say, come back. Yeah, that's the way to hell. He's not able to speak the word facially, factually, and transparent him because of love. He says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. The Lord give us perfect love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Everything we have heard that the Lord will cleanse us, cleanse us, cleanse us, put us from every form of uncleanness. He's able, he will. God bless you for praying. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.